With the hugely anticipated Marvel Spider-Man game finally crawling its way to the PS4 this week, I thought that it would be fun to make a video on the history of Spider-Man and video games. I researched literally dozens of games spanning over 35 years and had a lot of fun doing it. I didn't even realize how many video games Spider-Man was in. And aside from a few mobile games, plug and play devices, and some pinball machines, I'm pretty confident that this list is complete. Anyways, there's a lot to get through, I'll try and be concise, and if you liked it, or if there's something that I missed, let me know. So by 1982, Spider-Man already had two decades under his belt as an established superhero. While riding on the coattails of two successful cartoons a year prior, it was a no-brainer for Marvel to team up with Parker Brothers to hop on what was at the time a new fad called video games. And thus, the first ever Spider-Man video game ever created simply titled Spider-Man. It was also the first ever Marvel Comics game ever released. It came out for the Atari 2600 and was a technological advancement for the time. The whole game consisted of the player controlling Spider-Man to scale a building while defusing bombs planted by the Green Goblin. Once you get to the top, you simply just go around the Green Goblin and beat the level, which then the game starts over at a higher difficulty. Oh, and apparently Spider-Man shoots web out of his head in this game. Is this more action than even Spider-Man can handle? In 1984, Scott Adams released a trilogy of Marvel text adventure games called the Quest Probe series. One being the Hulk, another being the Human Torch and the Thing, and another one featured, you guessed it, Spider-Man. It released on numerous systems and involved Spidey wandering around an apartment building, defeating enemies and solving puzzles. The series actually had a fourth game developed featuring the X-Men, but never got released due to the fact that developer Adventure International went bankrupt. Five years go by, and in 1989, Paragon Software developed Spider-Man and Captain America in Doctor Doom's Revenge. It was a 2D fighter where the player, either as Spider-Man or Captain America, fight through a series of known villains one-on-one -on -one until they reach Doctor Doom. It was a bad rip-off of other successful games at the time that were hot off the press, like Street Fighter and Double Dragon. Fast forward a few months in the same year, and Shinobi 2 The Revenge of Shinobi comes out with controversial fake representations of not only Spider-Man, but Batman, Rambo, The Terminator, and Godzilla as bosses in the game. I'm mentioning this appearance because around a year after its release through a software revision, Spider-Man became a licensed character in Shinobi 2 due to a copyright agreement between Marvel and Sega. But since the licensed use of Spider-Man boss was only for a limited time, his appearance had to be revised yet again 20 years later for its release on Xbox Live Arcade and PlayStation Network in 2009, which they just simply replaced Spidey with a pink palette swap and called him the Web Ninja. Wow, the early 90s was huge for Spider-Man and video games. In 1990, the decade started off with, oddly enough, two Spider-Man games by the same title but different developers. The Amazing Spider-Man was obviously capitalizing on the release of Todd McFarlane's excellent comic book released the same year. One of the games was released by prior developer Paragon Software for home computer systems and was a puzzle-oriented action game. The other game by the same name was developed by a little company called Rareware. It was the first game of a trilogy and came out on the newly introduced Game Boy. It was a side-scrolling beat-em-up game which obviously had great influence on the classic Battletoads which was released the following year and also developed by Rareware. Yet another Spider-Man game was released the same year titled The Amazing Spider-Man vs Kingpin. This was the first Spider-Man game released on Sega system and developed and published by Sega as well. This game was widely popular with comic book fans and helped establish the success of 16-bit Sega Genesis. The game was released on all Sega systems eventually, with each iteration including new levels, enhanced graphics, and a few incremental improvements to the gameplay. It premiered on the Master System and Genesis in 1991, followed by the Game Gear in 92 and the Sega CD in 93, with the Sega CD being arguably the best version due to its substantial upgrades 
with voice acting, animated scenes, more content, including multiple endings, and faster, more fluid gameplay. This was definitely a milestone, being arguably the first great Spider-Man game. Spidey appeared in two games in 91, first being the Punisher Ultimate Payback, where he acted more as a cameo appearance giving tips on how to beat levels and swinging down to take away hostages once you've rescued them. And a second, more noteworthy game was the arcade classic Spider-Man the Video Game. It was very similar to Captain America and the Avengers released the same year. The game was ran on an arcade system running the Sega System 32 hardware and featured four playable characters including Spider-Man, Black Cat, Hawkeye, and the Submariner, who each had unique special moves. It was a great four-player co-op beat-em-up that became a staple in any 90s arcade. In 1992, they just wanted to keep releasing Spider-Man games. First there was The Amazing Spider-Man 2, which was a different follow-up to the one that Rareware made, being developed by Bit Studios this time around, who also in the same year released yet another Spider-Man game for the NES and Master System called Spider-Man Return of the Sinister Six. This is a side-scrolling platform action game, which definitely took some cues from Batman the video game. It also wasn't really very good. <laughs> Also in 92 was Spider-Man and the X-Men in Arcade's Revenge, released on the Super Nintendo. The game starts a three-game run from developer Software Creations, a company that I'll mention again in a minute. If you were a kid in the 90s, the concept alone was enough to get you really excited. And after appearing in multiple solo games, Marvel's most popular characters were now co-starring in the same game. It's a superhero mashup game that bounces back and forth between five playable characters, specific to the level, including Spider-Man, Wolverine, Gambit, Storm, and Cyclops. It was a very hard game and not really that good. Good thing Software Creations bounced back with its next year's installment. So in 1993, there was the Amazing Spider-Man 3 Invasion of the Spider Slayers, the final game in the trilogy of the Game Boy series. Developed again by Bit Studios and published by LGN. I don't know, and I think they're trying to look like Mega Man or something? I never played it, but apparently it was pretty good. Then in 94, the second game from Software Creations and LJN was Spider-Man and Venom Maximum Carnage. Anyone who was playing video games at the time of this release remembers this game. Even though the title in front of the box was pretty misleading since Carnage wasn't even in the damn game that much, and it was, it was still pretty fun and still very tough beat em up with a double dragon feel to it. It felt very comic booky, complete with pows and thwacks, and the highlight is that you got to team up and play as Venom. Nineteen ninety five was another great year for Spider Man and video games, crawling his way into three titles, first being the amazing Spider Man Lethal Foes. This one definitely featured a more nimble, albeit gangly looking Spider Man, and you can also unlock additional content in this game by scanning barcodes with the barcode Battler two. Yeah, does anyone remember that thing? The next game released in 95 was a follow-up to Maximum Carnage, Venom, Spider-Man, Separation Anxiety. It was pretty much the same game, but a bit worse. Same level design, same pals and thrax, same recycled enemies, Spidey and Venom are still teamed up, you fight Carnage at the end who looks like he's prancing around trying not to crap his pants. Look at those butt cheeks though. <laughs> 95 was also the year that Marvel Super Heroes was re released in arcades. This game started a whole bunch of great Marvel fighting games by Capcom. You know what, let's just get through them all right now. 
So there's Marvel Superheroes, Marvel Superheroes vs. Street Fighter, Marvel vs. Capcom, Marvel vs. Capcom 2, Marvel vs. Capcom 3, Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3, Marvel vs. Capcom Origins, which is a remake of Marvel Superheroes and Marvel vs. Capcom, and Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. Last for 95 was Spider-Man the Animated Series. Obviously based on the acclaimed TV show, this is more of an action platformer than a beat-em-up. It was panned by reviews from everything from bad graphics and sound to bad controls and limited gameplay. Not to mention that the Super Nintendo and Genesis versions were very different. Thankfully, this almost ends the era of mainstream 2D Spider-Man side-scrollers. Yes! Yes! Except for the Amazing Spider-Man Web Fire. Released in 1996 on the 32X and is known for being one of the most rarest games on the system. You see, Web of Fire was released after Sega announced that they were dropping support for the 32X, so the game didn't really get any coverage from the press, with outlets that did review the game saying that it was average at best. GamePro stating that the game was a decent side-scrolling, web-slinging, thug-punch and fun, featuring nimble sprites, lots of crawly moves, and fine graphical details. Spider-Man Web of Fire won't disappoint Marvel fans, though it doesn't raise Spider to the pantheon of great video game heroes. So after a couple dozen lackluster brawlers, Spidey decided to take a four year hiatus from video games. Mostly due to the fact that in 1996, Marvel actually filed for bankruptcy. You see, comic books took somewhat of a dive in the late 90s and Marvel owed a lot of money. That's why they sold all their big name cinematic rights to companies like 20th Century Fox and Sony Pictures. Fortunately enough though, through tense legal battles and merging with Toy Biz, they came back and they hired Activision to produce their Spider-Man games for the next 14 years. And Spidey came back in arguably one of the best Spider-Man games ever created. It took advantage of next generation hardware and was the first game to feature Spider-Man fully voiced in a 3D world and finally gave Spider-Man fans the game they deserved. It was developed by Neversoft and used the brand new Tony Hawk's Pro Skater engine. This action adventure was originally released on the PlayStation and then got ported over to the Nintendo 64, Game Boy Color, Dreamcast, and PC. This critically acclaimed game pioneered the combat and web sling and gameplay mechanics that paved the road and influenced almost all of the future entries into the franchise. What's going on here? Hold it, Spider! He doesn't look friendly. You can kick, punch, or use your web attacks to get past this guy. Oh yeah! After that, Spidey didn't waste any time and released a follow-up to this game the next year titled Spider-Man 2 Enter Electro. Since Neversoft went back to develop Tony Hawk games, this time around the game was developed by Vicarious Visions, who went on afterwards to mainly develop ports of games. Most notably Jedi Knight 2, Guitar Hero, Crash Bandicoot, and Destiny 2, plus a slew of others. If you've played the previous game, you know exactly what to expect from Enter Electro. It's pretty much the same game with a facelift. The graphics are a bit better, there are a few more moves in combat, there are ground levels, and the music is a bit better. While still a good game, due to its lack of change and innovation, didn't really hold up to its predecessor. <laughs> The same year, there were two more Spider-Man games released on handhelds. Spider-Man 2 The Sinister Sticks for the Game Boy Color and Spider-Man Mysterio's Menace for the Game Boy Advance. Sinister Sticks is a follow-up for the Game Boy Color port of 2000 Spider-Man, but Mysterio's Menace was also developed by Vicarious Visions, the same company who just did Enter Electro the same year. So shouldn't the titles be swapped or something? Even Mysterio's Menace looks like Enter Electro. Yeah, whatever. 
Oh, and Spider-Man also made an appearance in X-Men Mutant Academy 2 this year, a 3D fighter released on the PlayStation. So it's 2002 now. With next generation consoles hot off the press, it's time for Spidey to get a facelift. And with Sam Raimi's immensely hyped Spider-Man movie, it was a no-brainer to release a video game alongside it. Thus, Spider-Man the movie is released. Boy, aren't Spider-Man titles deceiving sometimes, because this game was very loosely based on the movie. Aside from aesthetics, some light characters, and Tobey Maguire and Willem Dafoe doing voiceovers, it really had nothing to do with the movie at all. Still somewhat a decent game developed by Treyarch, and who can't forget Bruce Campbell. Yeah, I know, you want to get on with things, beat up the bad guys, do the whole superhero thing, blah blah blah. Well, everyone's got to start somewhere. Trust me, when you're hip deep in trouble later on, you'll be glad you went through this. All right, now let's get started. Now get the gum out of your ears and listen good. 2004 rolls around and Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2 comes out. So I guess it's time for another video game, right? And Treyarch is at the plate again. Spider-Man 2 has arguably the best web slinging in any of the games. It introduced a new physics system that lets Spidey sling along in three dimensions. It felt more fluid and natural. I'll never forget the impact and the fun that I had spending hours just swinging around the open world based on New York City. So the following year, Treyarch wasn't done with Spider-Man just yet. Just one year later, they released their third Spidey game, Ultimate Spider-Man. It was based on the acclaimed comic series at the time. You play as a younger version of Peter Parker and spend the game trading between him and Venom. Treyarch improved on everything from their last open world adventure. They embraced and nearly perfected this amazing cell shaded comic book look. Still to this day, no Spider-Man game has looked so much like a comic book like Ultimate did. Hopefully we can eventually get another Spider-Man game like this sometime soon. In the same year, Marvel Nemesis Rise of the Imperfects was released. It was a fighting game produced by EA and had Spider-Man and Venom as playable characters. <laughs> Spider-Man Battle for New York was released the following year on Nintendo DS and Game Boy Advance. You want to guess what kind of game it was? Yeah, just another okay brawler. This game looked pretty and the cutscenes were drawn by Marvel artist Ron Lim, but just didn't really impress too many people, even with the Green Goblin as a playable character. A more notable release this year was Marvel Ultimate Alliance. It was an action role-playing game developed by Raven Software, the same people that brought you X-Men Legends and X-Men Legends 2. It was the same type of game, just a little bit better. It was a top-down beat-em-up featuring characters from X-Men, Avengers, and Fantastic Four. It did a lot of fan service and also had a follow-up in 2009. In 2007, Spider-Man 3 came out. Yet another Spider-Man movie game that's almost insultingly loosely based on its source material. This game looked good, but it was a total mixed bag and just barely what you wanted. It didn't flow the way it should have, it had bad frame rate, bad bosses, and the combat consisted of just basic butt mashing. Definitely not the best outing for Spider-Man in video games. Only a few months after Spider-Man 3 came out, Activision decided to pump out yet another Spider-Man title just before the holiday season called Spider-Man Friend or Foe. It was a superhero mashup game and was definitely targeted for kids. This is another one that I don't really remember playing, but it got criticized surprisingly for being too easy and too repetitive. 
You can grab containers and throw them as ranged weapons. Red orbs will be. The following year, our favorite web slinger is featured in Spider Man Web of Shadows. This was another game that looked great and that was super fun slinging around the city, but the actual game was just pretty bad. After six years of licensed Spider-Man movie games, Activision had the opportunity to make an original Spider-Man game and they screwed it up. With illogical button mashy controls and a downright lame story and quests, it was definitely a disappointment. Fast forward one year, and in 2009, Spider-Man Toxic City was released. It was a comic book style side-scrolling brawler for mobile devices. Enough said. 2009 also marks the release of Marvel Super Hero Squad. It released alongside the TV show of the same name, and was another game geared towards kids. It had a cute stylized renditions of Marvel Super Heroes, and yet another top-down brawler. I got turned into a rock! <laughs> in 2010, Spider-Man Shattered Dimension comes out. Yes! Finally! Another good Spider-Man game! Finally! So Beatnox decided to take the old mainstream video game range for Spidey for the next four iterations. Thankfully, Shattered Dimension is one of the good ones. While not rising up to the high standards that Batman Arkham Asylum set for the comic book games in a year prior, Shattered Dimensions has still managed to serve up a bizarre story spanning across four different versions of Spider-Man, all with completely different gameplay mechanics. There are definitely some great Spidey moments here. Unfortunately, all of the good things that Shattered Dimensions did were pretty much undone by the crappy follow-up and spiritual successor Spider-Man Edge of Time. Literally everything good in the first game was gone. The awesome art style, the varied gameplay, the great story, it was just a very limited and repetitive Spider-Man game. Even web-slinging wasn't even that fun. And the whole what you do in the past affects the future gimmick felt unimportant to the gameplay. It's 2012 now and The Amazing Spider-Man comes out in theaters, because we really need another origin story. So, another licensed game, right? Yeah. This is developer Beatnox's third installment of the Spider-Man franchise. So did they redeem themselves from their last lackluster outing? Well, kinda. The Amazing Spider-Man had pretty much all the shortcomings that other bad Spider-Man games had, had just enough plot to keep you playing, padded by repetitive boring side quests, button mashy dull combat that was a poor emulation of the Arkham series, the setting was static and it had bad bosses and lack of polish. But swinging around Manhattan was just so damn fun, which is the only thing that makes this game worth playing. In 2013, there were two mobile Spider-Man games, and both were actually pretty good. Ultimate Spider-Man Total Mayhem and Spider-Man Unlimited. Total Mayhem was based off the recently released Ultimate Spider-Man TV show, and was also actually a really good game. It had fantastic visuals for a mobile device, and the combat was surprisingly deep and really fun. The outlets that did review it said that it was the best superhero game on mobile devices. Spider-Man Unlimited was an auto-run game that kind of played it safe. If you played an auto-run game, then you know what you're getting into. But what makes this one so great is that it's very well produced and polished. Even though you don't do too much web-slinging in this game and you could literally reskin it with whatever you want, it still looked and performed great and it was very well received critically. The following year, The Amazing Spider-Man 2 hit the theaters and another cash grab video game hit the shelves. The movie sucked and the game sucked even more. 
Now the majority of the games on this list aren't really that great and I told myself not to get too negative in this video, but man, this game was just atrocious. It was very blatant that developer Beatnox was tired of making Spider-Man games. Taking a quote from one of the more accepting reviews, Jay McElroy from Polygon stated, I've accepted that there's probably never going to be a truly great Spider-Man game. If the dispiriting The Amazing Spider-Man 2 is any indication, Activision and Beatnox may have reached the same conclusion. There have been many worse Spider-Man games than this, but I can't recall one that swung so conceptually close to greatness only to let poor execution drag it back to Earth. But I have to disagree with his opening statement. He said that there will never be another great Spider-Man game. Well, it only took four years and another developer by the name of Insomniac Games to prove him wrong. In 2018, Marvel's Spider-Man is released. With reviewers praising the game for its amazing web slinging and combat mechanics, and free flow combat and gadgets influenced from the Arkham games is very apparent. Though the story is very paint by numbers and predictable, the way it's told and the level of production and presentation is outstanding. I have personally completed this game, and even though very familiar, it is still the best Spider-Man game since Spider-Man 2. A helicopter fight, trailing a crane, in the air above our teeming streets, on which it could have crashed at any moment in a blazing rotor chopping fireball of doom. Still think the web heads so that's it for the video. I applaud you for making it this far if you're still watching. So if you found this video informative or entertaining, consider giving me a subscribe. Thanks guys. Peace out. Yeah.